Growing medicines in plants you can pick for yourself. Treating persistent pain with killer marine cone snails and searching the globe for nature's own insecticides. It's research that sounds too diverse to be related, but all of it is the work of internationally acclaimed chemist, Professor David Craik. And all of it was inspired by one rather unremarkable looking African plant. This is a plant called Oldenlandia affinis, or uh, locally known as Calata calata. As you can see, it's just a, a weedy looking herb that grows all around the Congo region in Africa. Interest in the plant was sparked in the 1960s when Lorenz Gran, a doctor working for the Red Cross, saw pregnant women drinking tea derived from the plant to aid childbirth. It was later found that a peptide known as Calata B1 was the active ingredient in the plant. It's actually a uterotonic agent, so it affects the contractions of the uterus and makes the childbirth process much, much faster. But the question is, why did it even work? After all, peptides are small proteins, and protein drugs don't survive if you swallow them or boil them. So why did the Calata peptide survive both? The key was its unique structure. Typically, a protein is made up of a linear chain of amino acids with two ends. The sequence of that chain encodes its three-dimensional shape and function but it's still left with two loose ends. And when proteins are swallowed, enzymes called proteases target these weak spots and break the protein down before it's had a chance to deliver any therapeutic benefit. Our bodies have evolved basically to chew up peptides and proteins. Our bodies can't tell the difference between a piece of steak and an insulin tablet if such a thing existed. Of course, it doesn't exist. Insulin's given as an injection for that very reason, that it would simply be chewed up by the digestive enzymes in our body. In contrast, the structure of Calata B1 is circular, as Professor Craig discovered in the 1990s. Well, when we did the structure, we were actually quite amazed to see that the ends of the protein were joined together. This was a completely circular backbone, which was completely unprecedented at the time. So what's the advantage of having a circular structure? Well, the big advantage of having a circular peptide is that it has no ends, and so proteases or enzymes that normally chew up proteins just simply can't attack this molecule. It has no weak points, it has no ends to chew away at. Professor Craig found that Calata B1 was also braced with knotted crosslinks. This made it even stronger against destructive forces such as heat. The structure was called a cyclotide and offered the possibility of a new suite of much needed drugs. That's because on the one hand, you have existing small molecule drugs which are cheap, easy to make and can be swallowed, but they're not specific to their targets, so patients do experience side effects. On the other hand, you have existing protein drugs like insulin, which are specific to their targets and have fewer side effects, but can't be ingested. Cyclotides have the potential to bridge the gap. The holy grail of peptide-based drug design is to try and make peptides orally ingestible. So after we discovered this molecule, we thought, is this a one-off quirk of nature or might there be other examples of circular peptides? So that was my excuse to travel around the world, hacking my way through jungles and climbing mountains, looking for related plants to see whether they might also contain these cyclic peptides. And you found lots of others? Indeed, we found hundreds of these cyclic peptides now in about 50 different plants, but one plant can produce hundreds of individual peptides. So we believe that there'll be about 50 or 60,000 members of the family by the time we've finished the hunt. Apart from the drug potential, this bounty of cyclotides provides at least one evolutionary benefit for the host plants. A plant can't run away when a pest attacks it, so it has to have a good chemical defence. And these particular plants seem to have evolved these cyclic peptides as their natural insecticide. And we know that they're very effective because we've done feeding trials where if we measure the weight of the insects that are eating a normal diet compared to a diet containing cyclotides, there's just no comparison. The ones that are eating cyclotides either die or don't grow, so they're very, very effective insecticidal agents. Professor Craig is currently researching ways of putting cyclotides into crops that lack this natural defence. 
cotton is a crop that is very susceptible to insect predation and up until recently there was a lot of chemicals needed on cotton to protect it. If we could make transgenic cotton with cyclotides in it, then effectively we could have a natural, greener, inbuilt insecticide in cotton. The great advantage is that the cyclotide structure can have its insecticidal benefit removed and replaced with a sequence that codes for a pharmaceutical benefit. So we'll use this structure, and if we remove part of the molecule, then it loses its natural function, right. loses the insecticidal activity, and we replace it with a pharmaceutically relevant sequence of amino acids that might be useful in an anti-cancer drug, for example. Well, there's a really huge scope of diseases that we could have an impact on. Examples that we've looked at so far in animal models include multiple sclerosis, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory disease, infectious disease. So it's not limited to a particular disease type. Professor Craig also wondered if non-circular peptides could be made circular and more stable by linking their loose ends. To explore the idea, they chose a peptide from a rather strange source, the toxic venom of a marine cone snail. These snails harpoon fish using a hollow tooth and inject it with a potent venom that immediately paralyzes the prey. Some species have venom deadly to humans. The reason a cone snail needs such a potent venom is because of the nature of its prey. If you're a snail trying to catch a fish, you obviously need to catch that fish here and now. You don't want to injure it and have it being eaten by someone else 20 metres away. So they need to have a venom that hits every possible target site in the fish and immobilises it instantly. So cone snails have developed hundreds or thousands of components within their venoms, each hitting multiple targets. And this is just a gold mine of possible peptides that we can look at. Marine cone snail peptides are already the basis for drugs to relieve neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is where you get damage to the nervous system through either disease or some sort of injury that causes misfiring of those nerve signals and generates pain. But these pain-relieving drugs are only effective via intrathecal injection. That's where it's delivered directly into the spinal cord by a surgically implanted pump. Professor Craig's team have developed an oral alternative. The marine cone snail peptide they chose was braced with knotted crosslinks, just like the plant cyclotides. It also had loose ends that were close enough to be linked with six amino acids. In rat trials, it's proven to be 150 times more potent than the market-leading drug. Human trials are still several years away, but Professor Craig believes more drugs will follow. When we started, it was quite a challenge to develop the chemistry to join the two ends of a peptide together. Now we've developed it, it's actually applicable to a whole range of proteins, and so about 25% of them have their ends quite close to each other naturally, and so it can be applied quite broadly as a platform technology. Professor Craig's research is not just focused on discovering new drugs, but also growing them in plants. That's because once injected with a pharmaceutical cyclotide, plants that naturally produce their own can become efficient factories for the new genes. In terms of using plants as production factories, technically we're actually not very far off at all. We already have produced petunia plants producing pharmaceutically modified cyclic peptides. We envisaged the day where we could express our peptide in a seed and the, the seed would be the biopill. Many third world countries can't afford high-tech protein-based drugs, but if they could be growing these plants in their backyard, producing these designer protein-based drugs, it could be done very, very cheaply. So that's our dream for the future.